My name is Dr Brian Hughes and I'm a lecturer in the Department of History at Mary Immaculate College in Limerick and in this paper I'm going to talk about the reactions among Protestants and Unionists and perhaps also the lack of reaction amongst Protestants and Unionists to the signing and then to the ratification of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1921 and 1922 just over 100 years ago and also attempt somewhat briefly to put this in a broader context, both in terms of Limerick and, and nationally. On December the 10th, 1921, four days after the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed in London, an Irish Times editorial suggested that in accepting the treaty, it was the Southern Loyalists and Unionists who were perhaps surrendering most of all. They've watched the passage in mournful procession of the host of laws, institutions, traditions and ideals that bound them to Great Britain. They've embarked, not gladly, yet not afraid, on uncharted seas. They're entrusting themselves to the goodwill of, of a majority from which politically they have suffered much and which in the past they've had little in common save love of Ireland. The Southern Loyalists accept the treaty because the country accepts it and invites their aid in making it a success. There was thus nothing to be done except recognise the new order, offer some useful service and make the best of things. The treaty allowed for the creation of an Irish free state given dominion status on the same terms as Canada. It would have substantial if incomplete control over its own affairs but would remain tied to the empire. There'd be a governor general appointed by Britain and those elected to the Free State Parliament would declare an oath of fealty to the monarch. Those terms, and, and much more so than partition, caused a split in the Irish Republican Army and in Dáil Éireann, which was tasked with ratifying the treaty. It ultimately did so by 64 votes to 57, as is well known, but only after a number of weeks of heated debates. And when we think about the Anglo-Irish Treaty and the impact of the treaty, we thus tend to think about it in terms of the split in the Republican movement and the short but sharp and bitter civil war that followed, and in a Limerick context perhaps, uh, particularly the siege of 1922, or July 1922. But what of those whose political defeat had come long before the Dáil even began to discuss the treaty? Those who before 1919 had desired not a measure of independence or home rule or a republic, but the maintenance of the union with Great Britain. Under the terms of the treaty, the six county Northern Ireland established under the Government of Ireland Act 1920, and thus a fact uh, before the treaty was signed rather than a result of the treaty, were given the option to opt out, which they duly did. Northern Nationalists and Republicans were then effectively left to await their fate under a boundary commission that would decide on the final delineation of the border, something that those who accepted the treaty hoped, naively as it turned out, would ultimately bring the six counties into the Free State. But that Irish Times editorial I referenced at the outset reminds us of the other minority on the island, the Loyalist and Unionist minority, mostly but not exclusively Protestant, who had no such hope for redemption. Distinct from their old majority Ulster brethren in many respects, Southern Unionists were a relatively small and scattered minority. In 1911, there were just over 311,000 Protestants in the 26 counties that became the Irish Free State. That's about 10% of the total population, compared to about 2.8 million Catholics. Not all Protestants were Unionists, of course. Alexander Shaw of the famous Limerick Bacon Manufacturers, for example, had been an active Protestant home ruler in the 1860s and 1870s. But if the small but influential sets of Protestant nationalists and Republicans might be offset very roughly by cohorts of Catholic loyalists, large landowners, army officers, policemen, for example, this gives some sense, or these figures give some sense of the size of the Unionist minority in the 26 counties. Southern Unionist and Loyalist culture had been diverse and impressively organised in Dublin, comprising a small but strong working class community. Clerks, shopkeepers and professionals concentrated in suburban townships. Elsewhere outside of Ulster, including in Limerick, 
unionism was usually but not exclusively concentrated around the big landed estates, or in what Alvin Jackson has described as the networks of aristocrats and squireens who dominated rural Protestant society in the South and West. They're also found in small clusters in Limerick City, particularly amongst the, the business class, and in other urban settings. In rural Limerick, the unionist networks were particularly small. 97.2% of the population of Limerick County in 1911 were Catholic, with just 2,500 Church of Ireland, 136 Presbyterians, and 273 Methodists recorded in the census that year. In the city, the proportion was closer to that for the 26 counties as a whole, as Protestants made up almost 9% of the population in the borough area. Some 2,300 Church of Ireland or Episcopalian, 847 Presbyterians and 213 Methodists. Despite accounting for almost 10% of the borough population, unionists had failed to return any candidates in the 1920 local municipal elections held using proportional representation suggestive of a, a sort of a growing lack of organisation and, and uh, a growing unwillingness to, to put their, themselves forward on that platform by 1920. The editor of the Limerick Leader declared that the new PR system had been a success allowing those who held the, the national or political views of the majority, and by this he meant Sinn Féin, to rightfully dominate the council, while all substantial minorities have got due representation. Here, though, he referred to Labour, ratepayers and independents who secured six, four and four seats respectively, with unionists conspicuously absent and clearly not deemed a minority worthy of political representation in the eyes of the Limerick leader. Even during the Third Home Rule crisis between 1912 and 1914, when divisions between nationalists and unionists had widened in Limerick, the city and county's unionists took a noticeably moderate approach. In Dublin, thousands signed the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant at the Irish Unionist Alliance offices on Grafton Street on Ulster Day in September 1912, declaring that they would use all means necessary to defeat Home Rule. And though one had to have Ulster connections, to sign the Covenant, Dublin Unionists who were ineligible still declared their own willingness to resist uh, nationalist aims at self-government uh, to the press. In Limerick, meanwhile, at a meeting of 2,000 Munster members of the Irish Unionist Alliance on Henry Street, some weeks after the signing of the Covenant, Sir Charles Barrington of Glenstall Castle offered an important qualification to the Covenant sentiments. He declared that, the, that they would use every legitimate means to defeat Home Rule. Outside of the Protestant churches, Unionists in Limerick gathered in organisations like the Protestant Young Men's Association or the Church Lads Brigade. They might also gather at the Masonic Hall, the Masonic Hall on Castle Street. The Freemasons declared themselves to be non-political and non-party and non-sectarian as an organisation um, an organisation for men, and, and indeed only men, of all classes and creeds, but were often viewed with suspicion by Republicans, and alongside Masonic paraphernalia, one could find a Union Jack on display in the Limerick Lodge, and this Union Jack was burned during a raid in April 1922. Barrington was the Provincial Grand Master of the Freemasons of Munster, and a prominent Unionist figure in Limerick, during the Third Home Rule Crisis. Uh, separately, in April 1921, his daughter Winifred was killed uh, or by the IRA accidentally when the car she was travelling in with an auxiliary, a British Army officer and two others was ambushed. Um, Barrington, though, uh, Charles Barrington, though, made no public pronouncement on the treaty, nor did Archibald Murray, a Presbyterian merchant and long-standing president of the Protestant Young Men's Association. Indeed, the extent of the retreat of Limerick Unionists from public opposition to self-governance was long clear by the time the treaty was signed, and thus this is important context for understanding their reactions to it. In August 1920, Barrington and other prominent Limerick businessmen and county residents had publicly called for a withdrawal of the 1920 Government of Ireland Act, which implemented partition and created northern and southern parliaments. 
to be replaced by their own preference for dominion self-government within the empire for the whole island. Uh, the Quaker and corn merchant Gerald Goodbody declared that some of them who had been lately uh, unionists were prepared to overthrow their convictions in the cause of peace. Barrington agreed that the majority of unionists were with them in getting this job settled, while those still on the outside were few. In part motivated by protecting their business interests in the midst of revolution, this also reflected a desire to avoid partition and the exclusion of Six County Ulster from home rule. One thing Southern Unionists indeed shared with Nationalists and Republicans was an opposition to partition and the idea that they would be left on their own as a small and scattered minority. In the case of partition, uh, seen by Limerick and other Southern Unionists, as a greater evil than self-government by this point. By the time the treaty was signed and after the declaration of a truce in July, there was thus an overwhelming or seemingly overwhelming desire for peace amongst all else, among Limerick Protestants and Unionists, motivated, as I've said, by economic concerns and also perhaps fears about personal safety, along with pronounced war weariness after several years of war and conflict, which included the Great War between 1914 and 1918. This is reflected in the editorials of their newspaper, the Limerick Chronicle. The Chronicle's editor since 1908 had been Wexford-born Anglican John A. Baldwin, and his writing on the treaty demonstrated the moderatism of Limerick Unionism and its acceptance of the new order. It's worth remembering that contemporaries did not know, firstly, if a treaty would be signed and then if it would be ratified. And the alternative in both cases was a return to war. Uh, and so that's the kind of overarching, um, the overarching context of, of the discussion debates about the treaty, regardless of, of politics, is that potential for a return to war. Baldwin's first editorial after the, the treaty was signed declared that yesterday will go down in posterity as one of the most momentous and happy days in the history of Anglo-Irish relations. The unexpected has indeed happened. For some weeks past, the hopes or doubts of a settlement were barometric in their nature. Optimism one day gave way to pessimism the next and vice versa as the days passed. Almost up to the 11th hour, matters looked dismal enough until the sensational climax came on a surprised and highly gratified public. Even then, cautious people preferred to wait for details before satisfying themselves that all was well, but all doubts have vanished. Over the coming weeks, in between concerns about mail deliveries and potential uh, potential rail workers strike, Baldwin's editorials continued to proclaim that the vast majority of the people of Limerick, whatever their politics, desired peace. The truce had been an unspeakable blessing, as he put it, and relief to all classes of the community, and ratification of the treaty would secure that peace. On the 22nd of December, Baldwin focused on the return of American emigrants to Ireland for the Christmas season, prompted by the dawn of a new era in Ireland. Um, and so the idea being, what Baldwin was suggesting here is that sort of tourism into Ireland has, has been um, increased or improved by the um, security offered by the truce and then by the signing of the treaty. We look forward to that gladsome time, he continued, with lighter hearts and higher hopes than we did 12 months ago. On Christmas Eve, there was also some anxiety. Will the treaty be ratified or will it not? That is the question which is agitating the Irish people of every class and creed as it had become increasingly clear that the doll was uh, divided and perhaps irreparably divided over the issue of the treaty. The Chronicle's editor also pressingly suggested that while ratification would have been the best Christmas present that the country could have received, the Dáil's decision to adjourn, adjourn until January was potentially beneficial as TDs would have to return to their constituencies where the overwhelming support for the treaty would become clear to them. Indeed, at least one Limerick TD, Liam Hayes, was said to have been swayed to support the treaty over the Christmas recess by a local clergyman, in this case Catholic. The Church of Ireland supported the treaty too, but Bishop Harry Veer White, recently appointed 
Bishop of Limerick, Ardfert and uh, Agado for the Church of Ireland, seems to have, have kept his counsel publicly during the treaty debates and again after its ratification. And in a sense, the silences, or at least the kind of public silences are telling, suggesting that while it's clear that there was broad support for the treaty amongst Protestants and Unionists in Limerick, it was not seen as something to celebrate too openly or enthusiastically. If influence was put to bear privately or in unrecorded speeches and sermons, the influential members of the Protestant and Unionist communities, whether church or civic, perhaps also felt that their own flock needed little convincing about the benefits of the, the treaty, while the majority were unlikely to listen to them anyway. In August 1920, the call that I mentioned had been to avoid partition, even if this meant the end of the Union. While the option for Northern Ireland to withdraw meant the treaty did not guarantee this, the proposed Boundary Commission, whose outcome was then unknown notwithstanding, it did offer some consolation to Unionists as the Irish Free State remained in the Empire. Baldwin had highlighted this in his editorial on the 8th of December 1921, pointing to the common citizenship that the Irish Free State would have in the Commonwealth. There was some concern amongst Unionists about their fate in the new Irish Free State, though in 1920 and afterwards Limerick Protestants and Unionists had been keen, whether out of conviction or out of a desire to avoid provoking the minority, a majority, to stress that they had experienced no political or religious bigotry in the city or county. As I'll touch on briefly in concluding, this notion was challenged as soon as March 1922, when attacks were made on Protestant institutions in the city. But immediately after the signing of the treaty, Baldwin saw further consolation in Arthur Griffith's guarantee that uh, he desired, as Griffith put it, to secure the willing cooperation of unionists in common with all other sections of the Irish nation in raising the structure and shaping the destiny of the Irish Free State. This gave great pleasure to Southern Unionists as Baldwin saw it. Unionists and Clare met in January 1922 to discuss Griffith's uh, guarantee contained in a letter to British Prime Minister David Lloyd George. Their Limerick counterparts seemed to have declined to do so, uh, a sign, I guess, of, of that change in attitude that I noted previously, but also perhaps of their confidence in the settlement. On the 30th of December 1921, as local authorities, associations, Sinn Féin clubs and other groups across Limerick City and County met to support, reject or declare neutrality on the treaty, a meeting was held under the auspices of the members of the Limerick Chamber of Commerce. Among those present, present was businessman and former mayor of Limerick and IPP, Irish Parliamentary Party MP, Stephen O'Mara, Madge Daly of the famous Limerick Republican family and Alexander Shaw, who I mentioned earlier on. While there were a number of non-Catholics present, none of those in attendance spoke explicitly as a unionist or on behalf of unionists. Madge Daly, however, claimed that most of those present had always heretofore claimed fealty and loyalty to the foreign foe and that they had chosen to sign dumb as unspeakable atrocities were carried out by Crown forces in their midst. She would not discuss the rights and wrongs of the treaty, she said, with that assemblage any more than she would with the officers of the British garrison in the city. In a letter to the Secretary of the Chamber of Commerce, Kate O'Callaghan, widow of the murdered Lord Mayo Michael O'Callaghan and one of six female TDs, all of whom voted against the treaty, similarly insisted that, as she put it, with few exceptions, those gentlemen who were in, in attendance at the meeting did not help the national movement. It's common knowledge some of them worked against this country's interests and during the terror fraternised with the enemy forces. Either as individuals or as a body, the bulk of those comprising the meeting gave no help to the policy that has resulted in the present offer from England, uh, an offer that she was ultimately unwilling to accept. O'Mara had spoken strongly in favour of the treaty at the meeting, refusing to apologise for it, as he claimed other speakers uh, elsewhere had done, or other supporters of the treaty elsewhere had done, and proposed a, resolu a resolution declaring that the Chamber uh, and the representatives of the professions and traders in the county who were there herewith give expression to our considered opinion 
that a ratification of the Treaty of Peace between England and Ireland will bring contentment, happiness and prosperity to this country and therefore we believe that the treaty should be ratified. Daly's counter-proposal of an emphatic and direct negative was rejected and she remained the only dissenter as O'Mara's proposal was passed. The middle and upper classes in Limerick, therefore unionist and nationalist of all shades, lent their full support to the treaty, with, with very few exceptions it seems. If the story of Limerick unionism in this period is thus principally of moderation and acceptance as seen in their attitude to the treaty, this is not to say that all of their old allegiances were thrown overboard. While Barrington and many others in the city and county had long declared uh, or long decided that the union was dead and maybe not even in their best interests anymore, a sense of fealty to Britain and to the monarch did not disappear in January 1922. At a meeting of the young Protestant Young Men's Association in October 1922, for example, some months after their premises had been attacked, repeating similar attacks 10 years earlier, Archibald Murray told the gathering that they were now living in the free state of Ireland and, doubtless, they had carefully thought over the circumstances of the case and what was left for them to do. He trusted that they'd come to his conclusion that the government that they now had in this country is constituted by divine right. They had to wish the state every success. At the same time, however, the state had not given them up to the present any particular song or battle cry. They knew what the king's battle cry was, and so they would sing, as they were wont to do at their annual meeting, God save the king. The Dean of Limerick duly pronounced the benediction, and God save the, the king having been sung, the proceedings terminated. So in the midst of the civil war uh, in, in Limerick in August or in October 1922, I should say, there were still those willing to sing God Save the King, if among a sympathetic audience. By 1926, the Protestant Episcopalian population of Limerick City had dropped by 44.5% from its 1911 figure. Methodist numbers had declined by 51% and the Presbyterian community by an alarming 82.6%, raising questions about the experiences of Protestants and Unionists in Limerick during the Revolution. Questions also raised by that series of attacks on the Protestant Young Men's Association and the Masonic Hall in March and April 1922 that I briefly mentioned earlier on. Historian Brian Murphy has suggested there was no sectarian conflict between Catholics and Protestants in Limerick, though, that their, though their support for the treaty had made life more difficult for Unionists during the Civil War. However, as John O'Callaghan has astutely pointed out, the distinction between political and religious intolerance was a fine one, and it would have meant little to those who were targeted. That is, though, perhaps a discussion for another day. Thank you very much for listening.